So here's where we, I think we should begin our story with George H.W. Bush. And it all begins um, when uh, basically uh, Russ Baker says he would like, like this, this is, this was the, uh, the, the premier magazine, uh, you know, uh, 50th anniversary of the Manson killings uh, or, or whatever, like the 25th anniversary of the Manson killings. What was it? When did Tom O'Neill start with that? I forget. It was but, 90, 90, 98 or yeah, 99. So, uh, the, like the, the little factoid that led him down this rabbit hole is when he discovered a mention in a report that George H.W. Bush claimed that he could not remember where he was on November 22nd, <laughs> 1963, which is a astonishingly odd thing to say for any adult alive in America on that day. It is. It is weird. That's like the one thing. It's like nine eleven. Like they, everyone knows exactly where they were. Then they heard that that happened. That is. It's the thing that's always fucked with me about this is why couldn't he come up with a lie? Yeah. Like out of all people to not lie about it, why not him? Yeah, and he was there. He had a cover. He was there to meet a bunch of Texas oil men. Well, you know, nothing suspicious about that. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. I think I think H.W. Uh, Bush has said in other in other places that he was quote somewhere in Texas on that day, but he of course I don't, I don't know. I, I, it might have been grassy. It might have been rocky. I, I was. It was just. It was a knoll of some kind. Is all I'll stipulate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we should begin here with uh, like uh, one of the first. Um, sort of uh, keys that unlock this whole saga is that I, I forget when, but it was sometime in the 1980s, the entertainment journalist, uh, Joseph McBride, who worked for the uh, uh, daily variety at the time, uh, came across a memo in the archives of the university of San Bernardino while re- researching a book about the life of Frank Capra. And he got off on a tangent in the microfee section about the JFK assassination. Uh, McBride had been a volunteer for the Kennedy campaign. And of course, like you know, most Americans, has always remained interested in the unanswered questions about Dallas. He found this memo from J. Edgar Hoover, which was dated November 29th, 1963, that was titled Assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It reported that the day after the assassination, the Bureau gave a briefing to two men in Dallas, one, a Captain William Edwards of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and a Mr. George Bush of the Central Intelligence Agency. It briefed these men on the activity of anti-Castro Cubans. And McBride, while reading this, you know, thought Mr. George Bush of the Central Intelligence Agency, surely this wasn't the same person as the current vice president of the United States. Now, keep in mind here, Bush had been the director of the CIA for about a year and came to, I mean, during the 70s, during the late 70s, he was appointed director of the CIA. And he came in during a time of intense pressure on the agency related to the previous decades worth of fuck ups and embarrassment. Um, there was, of course, the Kennedy assassination and the uh, Warren Commission. And then there are all the revelations of how the CIA had used private foundations to channel funds to organizations inside the United States, such as the National Student Organization. Then, of course, there was Watergate and then the whole fucking just the, uh, the number of CIA operatives such as E. Howard Hunt that were all associated with it. And this whole like, you know, like the Church Commission and H.W. Bush was chosen at the time seemingly because he had no connections to the CIA or any of its bad shit over the last decade or so and was considered something of a lightweight. Uh, he was named by Gerald Ford, and uh, I'm quoting from Russ Baker here, he seemed wholly unqualified for the, for the position, especially at a time when the agency was under maximum scrutiny. He had been U.N. ambassador, Republican National Committee chairman, and U.S. envoy to Beijing, where both Nixon and Henry Kissinger had regarded him as a lightweight weight and worked around him. What experience did he have in the world of intelligence and spying? Or how would he restore public confidence in a tarnished spy agency? No one seemed to know. Or did Gerald Ford realize something that most others didn't? And that is, as this memo would seem to imply, George H.W. Bush has had a much longer association with the CIA than one that began with him being appointed director of the agency in 1976. Yeah, um, the CIA also the cover for this memo is very interesting uh, that they get into in Family of Secrets. Uh, the initial response to it was that uh, there was another George Bush who worked for the CIA, 
Yeah, yeah I, right. I, the yeah, guy who worked right. in like yeah, the right. fucking uh, mail room or something. Yeah, yeah, he was basically he was whatever Lloyd does for Ari and Entourage. That was his job at the CIA. He just got mail and probably just got yelled at by Mormons and alcoholics <laughs> or, al- like, or alcoholic oh, yeah, Mormons. Yeah. Those yeah. are the best CIA agents. The Mormons oh, yeah. who drink. The best. <laughs> it's, oh, uh, the the craziest real, CIA but, agents are the Mormons who drink and the Irish who don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. But um, so the failed George Bush, this guy who didn't really have a clearance, was a clerk, like a glorified intern who only worked nights, which is <laughs> the six, the 50s and 60s were awesome. You could get a night job at the CIA if you were white. <laughs> if you were a white Protestant, People would be, yeah, go ahead, work the night shift on the CIA <laughs> and make, you know, a $2 an hour, which is enough to buy a nine-bedroom house in Silver Springs. But uh, I, I digress. He had no clearance. Why would they send George Bush, the night desk worker, a memo about threats on President Kennedy's life? An interagency memo, which you have to yeah. have very high clearance to uh, be debriefed on. And it was a memo that was specifically related to the a- activities of anti-Castro Cubans and this idea that um, that they, they might use the confusion or uh, implications of a Kennedy assassination to launch like a second wave of attacks against Cuba. And they wanted to, they, they wanted to keep these guys in pocket. So yeah, like the memo was all related to the like connections to anti-Castro Cubans, which is of course a huge part of the Kennedy assassination. Now, um, McBride followed up about this memo and contacted the White House. Uh, he never uh, talked to George H. W. Bush directly, but did talk to uh, Stephen Hart, who was a member of the administration and I think part of the national security team, who responded to him by quoting Bush directly, who says, quote, I was in Houston, Texas at the time and involved in an independent oil drilling business, and I was running for Senate in late 1963. I don't have any idea of what he was talking about. Uh, Must be another George Bush is how it concluded. Um, now, after pub- and then McBride went on to publish a piece about this memo in the Nation, and the- after that piece came out, and like no one made much of a deal of it, it was you know barely noticed. But he, uh, following up on that, the CIA told him, and that in response to this article, that it was indeed another George Bush, the one that Felix referred to, a man named George. William Bush, who that they was, you know, on their payroll at the time, but now apparently the CIA, a, you know, one of the most powerful government agencies in the world with billions of dollars at their disposal, could not find George William Bush. However, Joseph McBride did to track him down. And in 1988, he was working as a claims representative for the Social Security Administration. And as Felix uh, uh, laid out earlier, he explained that he had been worked only briefly at the CIA as a probationary civil servant and only in Langley, Virginia. He was in the CIA headquarters in November 1963 and never in his career received any briefings and, and, and certainly not any interagency briefings during his career. Now, if we jump ahead in time now to 2006, there is another declassified document that came to, comes to light. Uh, this one dates to 1975, right before George H.W. Bush became CIA director, that flatly states that the man soon to be in charge of the relationship had of the agency had a relationship with the agency that dates back all the way into 1953. It says here, quote, he became aware of this project through Mr. Thomas J. Devine, a a former CIA staff employee and later oil wildcatting associate of Mr. Bush. Their joint activities culminated in the establishment of Zapata Oil in 1953, which they eventually sold. After the sale of Zapata Oil, Mr. Bush went into politics and Mr. Devine became a member of the investment firm Train, Cabot & Associates, New York. They attached a memorandum describes the close relationship between Mr. Devine and Bush in 1967 to 1968, which, according to Mr. Allen, continued while Mr. Bush was our ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, now, keep in mind here, so this figure, Thomas Devine, who was the guy who founded uh, Zapata Petroleum, Zapata Oil, and Zapata Offshore with Mr. Bush, with, with George H.W. Bush, when he broke into the oil industry in Texas, was a CIA agent. However... Thomas Devine resigned from the agency at the age of 27, which is highly unusual considering all the training he would have had to, all the training, time, and money that would have been invested in someone like Thomas Devine being part of the agency. However, 
it's not so strange when you consider the CIA has a long history of people, quote unquote, resigning to go on to work in the private sector. And of course, Zapata Petroleum was established in 1953. So here we get into Zapata oil and the entire oil business, which is, of course, from its inception in America, always been joined at the hip with like the sort of national security state, the deep state, even before the, those were a thing, long before the OSS existed or the CIA existed. Basically, oil companies and the attorneys at the law firms that represented them basically were well versed in sort of proto espionage. And indeed, many of the early recruits to the OSS, which would then become the CIA, were from the oil industry precisely because they had experience with international spying on competitors and industrial espionage. H.W. Uh, and Devine found Zapata Oil in 1953, and it basically is becomes the perfect cover for both international travel and the recruitment of you know, assets and operatives for the CIA. But however, H.W.'s history with intelligence goes back to even before his World War I experience. And, you know, that is when he joined the Navy at 18 and 1942. And he, in Norfolk, Virginia, received training as both a torpedo pilot, but also as an aerial photographer as part of something called Operation Snapshot, which was a highly secret, like it was directed at the Japanese, but it was basically, it was like using spy planes and what would become the same technology of like the U-2 spy planes. This was a very, very early version of using like Get intelligence gathering through aerial photography. Operation Snapshot was so secret that you could be court-martialed for even saying the name Operation Snapshot while it was in operation. According to a book by Robert Stinnett, uh, who was also a Navy pilot during World War II, Admiral Mark Mitscher uh, hit the bulkhead, quote, when he saw that the Bush, Bush's team had filed a report in which they actually referred by name to this top-secret project. The three people above Bush and his command were made to take razor blades to the pages of the report and remove the forbidden language. Now, according to Baker, this is Bush's first, the first time Bush had been stung by the disclosure of information. And he learned the lesson very well throughout the rest of his life in terms of excising information about people, places, and things that you did that were agency or sort of covert related that like you just don't talk about them or you use PR and obfuscation to manage those facts in your biography and resume. But from there, after World War II, of course, H.W. goes to Yale, which was by then a farm team for the CIA. I mean, like, yeah, that is that's that's the equivalent. Like we've basically replaced covert uh, rule in our empire with just overt military rule now. Like the CIA is just another arm of JSOC. So the 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 modern day equivalent would be uh, like a buds training or like the seal seal program but you know just just to return to yale and like the era of of george uh hw bush's graduating class i don't know if it was his graduating class or the one before it but like just to give you like an idea of what a farm team it was for the cia 35 men from one of the graduating classes would go on to work for the agency <laughs> 35 guys went to the same fucking place and and that's just of we know of and yeah. You know, here comes H.W., his father Prescott. He's got, you know, he's got Yale fucking pedigree going back two generations. He has already has experience in Navy intelligence under his belt because of World War II. And, of course, he joins Skull and Bones at Yale. Oh, just yeah. Like, just like Where his father. Where he jacks off in a coffin next to Geronimo's skull. Just like A real like thing that he really did. Not a joke. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, he was also, at, as a Bonesman, he was nicknamed Mammon. And Mammon was a nickname that every class had, and it was for the horniest guy in the class. <laughs> so one well, thing we know about a Poppy is that he was uh, he was laying pipe of some kind or another. Well, if I can get into phrenology a little bit, Poppy does have the skull and build of a guy with a dick that's too wide for his body. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I have a uh, I have a good friend who. Um, had about Poppy's build, and he was just like, we lived in the same house. We lived in an attic together when we lived in St. Paul, Minnesota. We were both very broke, and he would just walk around naked, and it was just like nine inches flat. <laughs> it was the most insane thing I've ever seen, and that's what I think Poppy was like. Probably he was well, he was uh, he was he was hanging dong. Well, here I mean, but like here's the thing about skull and bones, right? 
is that it, it is the oldest secret society of the American Ivies, but what mm-hmm. does it really do, right? I mean, like, I mean, on, on, on the surface, it is like Bohemian Grove, this kind of like fruity theater kid thing. Where right. it's like the, yes. the, these preppies have the, their little dinner clubs and they dress in costumes and they sing songs and they have these like weird rituals, like you said, where you jack off in a coffin with Geronimo's fucking skull. And that, you know, you, you do like uh, you have to confess all of your deepest secrets and like a group of men who are like, you know, nude from the waist up or just or from the waist down. And I forget how the ritual goes, but it's all it's all this kind of like, you know, just, yeah, like I said, like like Bohemian Grove. It's a lot of this theater kid shit. Yeah. That is just you know like it has like a a tinge a of the for these rich yeah. rich fancy font it, it, you know it has a, it has a tinge of the sinister but when you really get down to it I mean it, it's it's pretty stupid but yeah. but here's the thing what is it really all about like these secret societies and their secret rituals and their secret code words and their secret fucking handshakes and all that bullshit what is it really all about it's about proving that you can keep secrets. Mm-hmm. That's exactly how. That's what it. That's that. That is 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 that is its function, and that is why Skull and Bones and Yale and Princeton and places like that minted this entire generation of like business intelligence, news, and military leaders. Who, I mean, again, it's not a conspiracy. All of these people were friends. All of these people went to the same schools. All their dads were friends. All these people like, yeah. were literally in the same secret societies with each other. Going back to criticisms of Family of Secrets, I mean, yes, I do think there is probably some journalist, journalistic malpractice in the book. But in the end, if you intend to write a – intend to make a full counting of this family and specifically of H.W., you have to work on innuendos and circumstantial evidence – because so much of this is undocumented. You only see the result because so much of this is a result of these people first meeting each other when they were 18 and fucking jerking off in a coffin. (laughs) All of this is said without record, without anyone writing it down, without anyone seeing it. And then it just happens. Yeah. You have, that is what you have to work with. Yeah. And and Felix, like, I mean, to, to this point, it's like you're also left with only innuendo because these people are very, very adept at making sure that that is all that you have to go off of based on their fucking yes. resume and life story. I mean, like, as per the example about Operation Snapshot and him getting getting reamed out for just even saying the word in an official memo. I mean, this is why... You know, George H. But H. W. Bush in his memoirs has nothing about Dallas 1963. It has nothing about where he was or what he was doing or any any even any recollection of the assassination itself or mention of it. In fact, yeah. the only sources we have to go off that are Barbara Bush's book, where she like let slide you know some cover for what they were up to or what they were doing in Dallas and Houston at the time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all things that if you talk about them, it's just designed to make you sound like a crank. But it's like he can't say what he was doing because whether these are all possibilities that he did nothing, that he had a tad of involvement, that he hid the real killer's gun, that he personally did it, which I think is the most ridiculous. That's the least thing. incredible one. Yeah, right. But no matter which one it is, if he says anything, you could start pulling at the yarn and and unravel some of it. And the point is to never unravel any of it. To even even the thing that looks off that you know is off. Things like you know the boats in the Bay of Pigs assassinations being codenamed Houston and Barbara, things like that to make you sound like an asshole when you just point to the fringes of it that we all know are there. We all know it's there. We all know there's something there, but there's not enough written down for you to definitively say, yeah, he fucking killed JFK. Yeah. It's funny to say. I like saying it, but, uh, you know, yeah. Well, yeah, because look, these people all communicate by, like, uh, wasp telepathy, just a yes. collection of, of uh, hand gestures and, uh, and, and winks and translucent uh, vein in the temple <laughs> throbbing. Yeah. H.W., <laughs> H.W. is so interesting to me, and his life is so interesting to me, especially in the wake of Donald Trump. I think this is the perfect time to record this and look into this, because I have you guys, we're going to talk about this in part two, H.W. the politician, but 
did you guys ever watch that 60 Minutes interview with HW in 1980 I posted? No, yeah. no, I haven't. Um, it's very interesting because the questions they ask him are, hey, are you too nice to be the president? Yep. Are you a wimp? <laughs> what's the what's yeah. with the wimp factor? And and the whole wimp thing is it ended up being kind of his undoing, but that was it the, was, that was by on the his cover of own Newsy, design. Right? Wimp yeah, it president. was it was by his own design. It's like, okay, my choices are people see me as the heartless killer who snuffed out American Camelot and a lifelong spook and God knows what else. Or I'm like a bit of a fuddy duddy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what yeah. do I want? Oh, what do I, I don't want? Like Brussels sprouts. Yeah. And it's I think it's so interesting in the wake of Trump, who is a fucking pussy, but goes the opposite direction. Like ev- everyone goes the opposite direction of HW now, where they are these evil fucking people, but also wusses. Also never would have been able to, yeah, you know, fly naval combat missions to the Pacifics and in the forties or pull the trigger on an American president. Uh, they make a big showing with, yeah, black rifle coffee company or open carrying and Starbucks when really they're as pink bellied and resentful and bitter and queenish as Trump is. Yeah. Yeah. Everything degenerates over time. Uh, once he graduated Yale, Poppy, AKA HW was immediately hired by a company called Dresser Industries, the SR Dresser Manufacturing Company. It was, okay, the H, the SR Dresser Manufacturing Company was a small but largely unexceptional firm, but that found eager buyers in Prescott Bush's Yale friends, Roland and W. Averill Harriman, the sons of the railroad tycoon E.H. Harriman, a.k.a. the April family. Um, and that they had recently uh, set up a merchant bank to assist wealthy families in such endeavors. Uh, Dresser um, basically made its money because it held the patents on two very valuable pieces of oil extraction technology. And their whole business model was not based on the idea that they would own or extract the oil themselves, but they would have the copyright on the technology that you would need to extract the oil and that they would have a monopoly on that. You don't get rich in the gold rush by getting gold. You get it by selling shovels. Neil Mallon, who was known to HW as Uncle Neil, hired him in 1948 and after Prescott installed uh, Neil Mallon at the helm of Dresser Industries. And as Felix said, Mallon's primary credential was that he was, quote, one of them. He was, yeah, he was a Yale and a Scully. No, yeah, that is... I want everyone to, like, everyone, we've got some people in the professional class who listen. You know, you, there's so much you probably have to go through for your job, right? Like, you, you probably have to go through 10 rounds of interviews, two stages of group interviews. You had to, like, I don't know, go hitchhiking with your supervisor to prove that you can solve problems. I don't know what you have to do. <laughs> I haven't worked an actual job in, like, 10 years. But imagine if you could just go on vacation for six months just because – and then you just you wander in to visit your dumbass friends, and they're like, "Hey, do you want to make like a million dollars a year?" And you're like, "Yeah, I guess." <laughs> cool life. Now, yeah, it really did rule. Now here's the here's the deal, though. I mean, like, I, this is all around like the American oil industry, which is of course a very strategic business for quote national security. Um, it you know you need oil to have a navy, army, and air force, and American oil had driven the American war machine during World War II and, like, basically is one of the reasons, you know, America was able to uh, win in, in World War II is its productive capacity and, like, its endless supply of oil. However, by the end of World War II, America had basically, like, we still had plenty of petroleum, but we had exhausted, like, most of the oil fields in America. We had, we had involved, like, I mean, not, not tapping it out completely, but like it involved a huge expenditure of America's own oil resources. And so much so that um, Roosevelt's Secretary of the Interior and later his petroleum administer for the war warned in 1943 that, quote, if there should be a World War III, it would have to be fought with someone else's petroleum because the United States wouldn't have it. Who does have the petroleum? Saudi Arabia. And this, of course, you know, goes into the whole deal that FDR made with, 
the Saudis, the Bitter Lake uh, Adam Curtis documentary goes into all of this after World War II, which was, you know, that that set in place like the dominant American foreign policy towards the Middle East for basically from then up until now, which is that we provide cover to let the Saudis do basically whatever they want in exchange for that we are that we will have we are the primary buyers for the Saudi crude reserves, like Saudi crude. Like that we would have untrammeled access to Saudi crude in perpetuity and it would be on like, you know, it would be a deal on our terms, but like basically we would always, always provide cover for like the Saudi royal family and they could do whatever they want, i.e., you know, proselytize fundamentalist Islam to the rest of the fucking Muslim world. Yeah, the the f- different forms this deal has taken on is very interesting. Uh, and I hope one day someone writes a book just about the military hardware purchases. I mean, John Dolan, the war nerd, has written very extensively about uh, how Saudis, we get a little bit of a rebate for our weapon sales because the Saudis will buy highly expensive state-of-the-art American military technology with the fundamental ex- understanding that the Saudi military alone could not hold it in an uprising. That would have to be the Americans. Uh, it's an insurance policy. It's yeah. an expensive insurance policy. Hey, you don't want this falling into the hands of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or ISIS, do you? Okay, well, you're always going to be at the ready. The One of the more formative events for the modern relationship between the West and the Saudis and the Saudis' understanding of their own kingdom was in the 70s when an uprising took the Grand Mosque in Mecca and Saudi troops were completely unable to retake it just from a ragtag group of assholes who thought their cousin was the Mahdi. Uh, <laughs> they had to use French had, mercenaries, right? They had to use French, former French uh, GIGN commandos. There is an urban legend that because non-Muslims could not enter the Grand Mosque, that they forced the French to convert to Islam before going, and then they <laughs> went back being Catholics after. But that's never been confirmed. I like to believe it. It's funny, but I don't know that that happened. Uh, but there was also sort of a deal where Saudis were buying unusually high volumes of T-bills uh, during times of extensive American deficit spending. So there are, again, this is one of those things that isn't, no one's going to outright say it like no one, no one who works at DOD or state is going to go, Hey, they're buying, they're buying our, our, you know, uh, they're buying a bunch of fucking missiles that they have no intention of using and cannot defend, uh, just so it's an insurance policy, but Hey, we're making out ahead or Hey, they're buying our T bills because we buy their oil. It's a rebate deal that but, we have. Yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's, but it's something, you notice something's going on. And you know, I mean like just to, just to bring it into the present moment, for example, I mean, like, if you've ever wondered why the, you know, America would back to the hilt Saudi Arabia's genocidal war against Yemen over the Obama, Trump, and now potentially Biden administrations, I mean, I think it all goes back to essentially this deal that was made after World War II, where, like, in order for America to be a global military hegemon, and to, like, you know, stand as a bulwark against communism and prosecute the Cold War, our empire needed unfettered access to Saudi oil. And that continues to this day. And that's why they can do things like carry out the worst ongoing war crime in the world with the full cooperation of the U.S. military and government. So back to to Dresser here. Dresser Industries was also known for providing covers for CIA agents and assets. And H.W. goes to work for Dresser in 1948. But things get interesting when the Cold War really heats up in 1950, when North Korea invades the South. Now, this is important because it caught the U.S. intelligence community completely off guard and heads had to roll because it was a huge embarrassment for them. So who steps in? Well, a man named Alan Dulles. We've already heard about his brother, John Foster, in his relationship to this story. But Alan Dulles becomes the direct deputy director of clandestine activities. And guess, wouldn't you know it? He just happens to have had a decades-long relationship with the Bush family prior to that. Even as far back as World War I, 
when Dulles's uncle was serving as Secretary of State, Prescott's father, Samuel Bush, oversaw small arms manufacturing for the War Industries Board, and a young Alan Dulles played a crucial role in the fledgling intelligence services operations in Europe. Later, the families interacted regularly as the Bush clan plied their trade in investment banking and the Dulleses in the law. So, like, basically, the Bushes were the bankers and the Dulleses were the lawyers. And like like th- th- those two were you, th- their relationship united those two sectors of American power, and they were the ones who knew how to get things done. They were the ones who, like they, they controlled the money and they had the keys to all the doors through banking and the law. So Dulles, at the same time as Dulles is taking over all clandestine, clandestine operations for like the U.S. intelligence state and national security state, uh, Dresser Industries relocates to Dallas which was becoming a r- rapidly becoming the center of both the defense industry, but also new oil capital. This was like, you know, th- this was like the West Texas oil boom was minting these like these new like titans of industry. And of course, Neil Mallon was at the center of all of it, bringing together sort of these uh, politically conservative, like the elites of Dallas society together with, um, what was uh, then a, 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 a nonprofit group called the Council on World Affairs. And Mallon had been active in the Cleveland branch of that. It had been started in 1918. Basically, it was a localized equivalent of the Rockefeller-backed Council on Foreign Relations, Council on Foreign Relations, the presidency of which Alan Dulles had just resigned to take his post at the CIA. So in September 1951, there was an organizing meeting at Mallon's home which featured uh, a, a group of people in that meeting, which included Fred Florence, who was the uh, founder of the Republic National Bank, whose Dallas office tower was a covert repository for CIA-connected ventures. There was a guy named T.E. Braniff, who was a pioneer of the airline industry and a member of the Knights of Malta. Then there was Fred Wooten, who was an official at the First National Bank of Dallas, which would then later go on to employ H.W. Bush in the years between his tenure as CIA director and vice president. And then a guy named Colonel Robert G. Story, who was later named as a liaison between Texas law enforcement and the Warren Commission investigating the assassination of President Kennedy. This group backs Eisenhower for president, and George H.W. Bush is made Midland County chairman on the Eisen-Nixenhower campaigns in both 1952 and 1956. So young George H.W. Bush finds himself sitting at the nexus of basically the Eastern establishment, the incoming administration, and this huge new wealth created by in West Texas oil. Ike becomes president, and the Dulles brothers cement their control over all of U.S. foreign policy. John Foster Dulles becomes Ike's Secretary of State, and uh, Alan Dulles becomes head of the CIA. And guess what? Ike's Treasury Secretary, Robert B. Anderson, was a longtime member of the Dresser Industries Board of Directors. Now, here's the thing. Eisenhower was a general. He was, you know, he was the top general of American forces in the European theater for World War II. I mean, Operation Overlord, D-Day, that was all Eisenhower. And the thing is about generals is that they like delegating authority. He did not want to be involved in the day-to-day grind of politics. So he was happy to sort of farm out a lot of the sort of functions of state to guys like the Dulles brothers. And it's sort of like the, these da- the daily tasks of being president were kind of boring to him and like it was not seen as like his role as an executive to oversee every aspect of them so what did they do with this authority being delegated to them guatemala and iran and of course it's Mellon's council of world affairs that um just like was involved in a lot of this um basically at the beginning of his administration they uh sent 15 members on a three-month world tour for meetings with what the group characterized as quote responsible political and business leaders. Uh, After the group returned, Dulles came to visit with the Dallas Council chapter, and at the same time, the CIA was in the process of creating uh, plausible deniability for what would eventually become its efforts to to topple uh, unfriendly regimes like Arbenz in Guatemala and Mossadegh in Iran. Here's the problem, though. The CIA's charter explicitly prohibits any kind of domestic covert operations. So the way around that is you have to create a you have to create an entire environment, like an entire ecosystem of middlemen to support 
you know, support rebels in countries that are targeted for regime change. And during the early days of Dallas, uh, of Dresser in Dallas, and then eventually Zapata Petroleum, um, Dulles was beginning to experiment with ha- running these off the books operations. And companies like Dresser and then Zapata Petroleum were like the perfect covers to uh, not just run off the books operations, but to fund them as well. Zapata Petroleum is founded in 1953 uh, with investment money from his uncle Herbie Bush, also Yale Skull and Bones, class of 1927. And uh, just a quick note here about Uncle Herbie. Uh, he also he was inter- instrumental in bringing others, including Eugene Meyer, a Yale graduate and owner of the Washington Post. Uh, Meyer was an, a, one of a number of media titans who were friends with Prescott and fellow Skull and Bones member Henry Luce founder of Time Magazine, and William Paley, who was head of CBS at the time. So like I said here, like this is, this is bringing together like, like all these people went to the same schools and were part of the same secret society in it, and then would go on to be the heads of basically banking, like the legal profession, the media, and the intelligence community. And Staten they all- Island, Brooklyn, Manhattan, <laughs> the Bronx. So, uh, Felix, you want to uh, let's talk about Zapata Offshore and how that worked. Zapata Offshore, um, also pending on audience, interesting hats coming soon. Uh, I've been informed I cannot be sued by the Bush crime family or Zapata's successor corporations for my Zapata oil hats that I have made for my friends and family. So uh, we'll see, but uh, no, I, I, I think I think I may sell those soon. But Zapata Offshoring, it was an interesting group of guys. It was founded in conjunction George H. W. and Thomas Devine, who we had mentioned earlier as the twenty-seven-year-old CIA wonderkind who had uh, retired. Yeah, he got all the intelligence. He just did <laughs> yeah, it very yeah. quickly. <laughs> yeah, some guys just some guys are just like they just breeze through it, right? Yeah. Zapata was for it was formed as offshoring was formed as a subsidiary of Zapata Oil. Uh, George H W was the president of off, Zapata Offshoring. Well, I mean, okay, so like uh, offshore drilling was a, a relatively like it was a newer technology, and Zapata Offshore had a drilling rig called Scorpion that was they they were able to move from the Gulf of Mexico to K Sol Bank which was a very remote island in the Bahamas that was crucially 54 miles north of Cuba. And uh, the Quesal Island had also recently been leased to Howard Hughes, who had his own longstanding CIA ties, as well as what was known as his own private CIA. And these offshore platforms, basically, here's how they worked. George Bush would be given a list of the names of Cuban oil workers who, would, who, wanted, place, who wanted jobs. And wouldn't you know it, all of those Cubans who got placed in jobs working for Zapata Offshore were connected to Operation Mongoose, which is the CIA program to overthrow Castro. Basically, the oil platforms were the perfect training. They were like, they, they gave them jobs, covers, but also basically were, were like training camps for these Cubans to do raids on the Cuban homeland during like, you know, right after Castro had come to power. They call it Operation yeah. Mongoose. The other... The other thing that Zapata did, and it was in the perfect business for this, like if you run an offshoring business, you you could obscure a lot of like transportation of goods, transportation of arms, transportation of people. It can look like anything. Logistics. Offshoring builds. Yeah. They were a purchasing agent for the CIA oftentimes. Um, that it makes me think of, yeah, the boats in Bay of Pigs being named Barbara in Houston. Again, <laughs> like fucking weird coincidence, right? I mean, like, what, I mean, like, the thing is, like, the connection to Operation Mongoose here takes us back to that original J. Edgar Hoover memo that mentions a Mr. George Bush for the Central Intelligence Agency. What was that memo about? It was about, it was briefing them, the DIA and the CIA, on the FBI's concerns about these anti-Castro Cubans and like the chance that they may, I don't know, go off books again and do something crazy. Like, I don't know, kill the president of the United States. And like, that's the thing. It was like, 
this is all connected to these off the books operations in the Caribbean and Cuba in particular. Now, of course, Fidel takes power in the Cuban Revolution in 1959, and what does he do? He uh, he declares himself a communist not long after that, but even before that, he begins expropriating the property of several large American firms, specifically agricultural and mineral. And like this is this gets into the idea of like the sort of psychology of a lot of these guys too, because like when we talk about national security what does that really mean and for these guys it means particularly anything in the western hemisphere is ours if you have a country that has resources or anything that we want or need it's ours it is america's we control it not you and anything anything like what castro did they take it like these guys they take it as a personal insult to them it's like it's it's like there is an emotional psychological connection here to revolutions like Castro or governments like Arbenz or Mossadegh in Iran that attempt to use the natural resources of their own countries for their own benefit, that, that nationalize them or run them in the way that America would if we had those companies for the benefit of their own people and their own government. That's, that's why they have to go. And like these guys, these guys in the early CIA, the people who like these skull and bonesy guys who fucking did all of these assassinations and coups, there there is an emotional fucking part to this where they really regard it as kind of like an an insult to them personally, like an attack not just on America but on like their 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 very conception of them at like of, of themselves, their own sort of self identity, the idea that these countries could take what is rightfully ours from us just because it happens to be within their borders. It all goes back to jerking off in Geronimo Skull. It's the same act. It's the same thought behind it. It is the wasp as the rightful inheritor of the earth. Yep. And all its corners. The earth tells me there is no sin. And and it's a, just like as Felix, what you're saying earlier about them being basically a paymaster for the CIA. Um, this is quoting here from John Sherwood, who was chief of the CIA's anti-Castro operations in the early '60s, has said, "quote Bush's company was used as a conduit for these funds under the guise of oil business contracts. The major breakthrough was when we were able to, through Bush, to place people in Pemex, the big Mexican national oil corporations. And of course, Zapata's operations were just a a pure continuation of the model created." by Dresser Industries. It was like a one-to-one thing. They were basically, I mean, that's the thing. They're basically the same company. They're doing the same yeah. thing. It's just a different name. And and in and, and Zapata, George Bush was running it rather than working for it. Uh, just, just quoting here, it says here, uh, like they, they were innovative in, they, 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 in borrowing from uh, the in-house history of Dresser, uh, which he was basically one of the first companies to, have, to do this bold move of this innovative tax strategy that involved uh, creating a separate company in the uh, country of the Principality of Liechtenstein. Uh, the, the benefit here was that no American taxes had to be paid on international earnings until the money was returned to the United States, if it was returned to the United States at all. And, and the, basically, like the funds became such that uh, they were not repatriated or they were out of sight of federal authorities. And basically, there was no effective way of knowing where that money went or for what purposes. And Zapata, as like the umbrella corporation, which just consisted of a number of foreign corporations that were incorporated in each country where these drilling rigs operated. And it was basically created by uh, the tax department at Arthur Anderson and the tax lawyers at Baker and Botts. Arthur Anderson, another longtime player in American evil. I mean, even going up to Enron in the fucking late 90s. I mean, like, these are the, these are the accounting firms that create ways for American firms to not just hide profits from taxation, but to create these vast, vast flows of, of capital that are uh, essentially exist in a black box and are unknown to anyone but the people involved. And lo and behold, who's involved? Yeah, people are getting rich off of it, but it's really just, it's all the United States government and intelligence communities. Like, like that's what these corporations are at a certain level. They're allowed to make money and like i said a lot of people get rich off of them but they are still basically fronts especially in the oil business for the cia and what they want to do which is fund illegal wars assassinations and fucking yeah coups wherever they want because those countries have resources that we need and that we want so i mean like that brings us to yeah november 1963 in dallas uh george hw bush is running for senator 
And he's running for senator at like, you know, at a time when like the Republican Party, like as a whole, and of course, like, you know, like I said, he had been a, a chair uh, on the, the Eisenhower Nixon campaigns before that. But, you know, th- this was this was at a time when like the Republican Party knew that their political future was dependent on if they could break the South away from the Democrats and particularly the states of Florida and Texas and HW Bush running for Senate. There was a crucial piece of that political effort. You know, JFK had been just elected in one of the, you know, thinnest margins of victory in American history. One that was, you know, election that was probably stolen uh, by the Chicago syndicate for, on behalf of his father, Joe Kennedy, the third, you know, you could see all that in Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. But, like, you know, they, the Republican Party understood that it was, like, that their future depended on regaining the South and, like, sort of severing the South's tie from the Democratic Party, which was, like, historically, you know, the South, Dixie, was the, the Democratic Party stronghold. And, like, that's what the New Deal relied on. And, like, that was, like, a source of their power. So, you know, he was campaigning all over Texas possibly even in Dallas on the day of it. So the idea that he would be sort of unaware of the fact that Kennedy was in Dallas riding around in that car with a fucking open top in 1963 because he knew that he had to campaign hard in Texas to win re-election. And George H.W. Bush was, you know, forget any of the conspiracy aspects of it, just on the surface was a crucial part of the Republican effort to stop him from winning Texas and to regain the presidency and a control over the South. So again, the idea that he would be so reticent to share any memories about what he was doing there at that time or seemingly be unaware of why he was there and why Kennedy was there at the time is another very weird thing. Another weird thing that came up was something that came out in 1988. And like this is a, a, another memo that surfaced from November 22nd, 1963, where, and like, basically, uh, this came out because uh, something called the JFK Records Act was being proposed in like, late in George H.W. Bush's first term in his presidency because of things like, you know, a, a, a renewed inter- American, inter- American public's interest in the Kennedy assassination because of things like, you know, Oliver Stone's movie and, you know, like the, the expiration date on a lot of these sort of like uh, uh, classifications running out. And, you know, knowing how... <laughs> how many people close to him were, you know, very involved in this. George H.W. Bush had to let this JFK Records Act pass or else risk looking like out of touch with the public while he was trying to win re-election. And because of that record, that, that act, um, another memo was coughed up connecting George H.W. Bush and Zapata Oil to the Kennedy assassination. And that is that basically almost immediately after the Kennedy assassination, George H.W. Bush phoned the CIA to state that he wanted it to be kept confidential, but he wanted to basically let them know that he, in the weeks leading up to the Kennedy assassination, he had heard from another young Republican, a guy named James Parrott, that he was basically bragging about wanting to kill Kennedy and claiming that they were going to do it in either Houston or Dallas soon. So he was basically ratting on another guy for possibly being involved with the Kennedy assassination. But here's another, here's another person. And like, th- this is like, I, I really have to be brief here because, you know, we're running out of time and there is so much fucking more to discuss about this guy. But there is a guy named George DeMoran Schilt, who is a huge figure in the Kennedy assassination and has a very interesting connection to the George H.W. Bush and the Bush family. George DeMoran Schilt is a Russian emigre and wouldn't you know it, a petroleum geologist. And in 1976, when George H.W. Bush was director of the CIA, the agency received a letter from George. I'm going to call him George de Moron shit from now on because, you know, I'm not going to. Fucking Schultz. roasted. Yeah. George uh, doo de shit. Um, he, he wrote a letter directly to George H.W. Bush, director of the CIA, pleading with his, for his help. The letter says, maybe you will be able to bring a solution into the hopeless situation I find myself in. My wife and I find ourselves surrounded by some vigilantes, our phone bugged, and we are being followed everywhere. Either FBI is involved in this or they do not want to accept my complaints. We are driven to insanity by this situation. Tried to write stupidly and unsuccessfully about Lee H. Oswald and must have angered a lot of people. Could you do something to remove this net around us? This will be my last request for help and I will not annoy you anymore. 
his staff and, and ends with a sideways frown. <laughs> his staff assumed that this guy was a crank and asked if he knew him. And then wouldn't you know it, George H.W. Bush confirmed that he did. In an official response said, I do know this man, DeMoran Schultz. I first met him in the early 40s. He was an uncle to my Andover roommate late, and later surfaced in Dallas in the 50s, maybe, then surfaced when Oswald shot to prominence. He knew Oswald before the assassination of President Kennedy. I do not recall his role in all of this. Now, his connection to this guy is considerably more than the fact that he was an uncle to his old roommate at Andover. Basically, George de Morenschild and the whole Morenschild family is a family that basically is, is, like I said, they're Russian emigres who left Russia after the revolution and have been basically at this nexus of sort of a white Russian anti-communist, the oil industry and the CIA in exactly the same way that the Bush family is. It's just they have threads everywhere. But basically, George himself is, 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 a, is a character because him and his wife basically shepherded Oswald and his Russian wife into this community in Dallas that was sort of the white Russian community there. Like it was like a hub of white Russian anti-communists who had like left the Soviet Union and settled in America. And so, lo and behold, a lot of them ended up in Dallas. And this is a very weird thing. He's a character in Don DeLillo's Libra. He's a fairly big character in that book um, because like he in the years from 1962 to 1963, he was probably the most influential person in Lee Harvey Oswald's life. Like I said, like he got him jobs. He was like socially, like intimately involved with him and his wife. Like he looked after their baby and was like after Oswald was killed, like they, they basically protected Oswald's wife from scrutiny and like gave her like the script to say that and, like she was the one who was like you know other than the the gun itself was the smoking gun of saying like yeah Oswald did it because of x y and z the weird thing about this is that like why would Oswald and his wife be shepherded into this like white russian community after the fact that Oswald had defected to the soviet union as a marxist and was like going around New Orleans handing out like hands off Cuba pamphlets. Yeah, it's pretty it's, weird. It's, very, wife, it's very odd. His his wife was the daughter of a KGB colonel. That seems like it'd be awkward dinner conversation with all those anti communist Ruskies. And of course, uh, De Morin Schilt and his wife uh, testified to the Warren Commission, which spent more time with them than any other witnesses excepting Oswald's widow, Marina. They basically characterized him as a colorful and eccentric character, but uh, steered away every time uh, Morin Schilt recounted another name from the staggering list of his influential friends and associates. Uh, in the end, the commission basically concluded that it was all coincidences and nothing more. By the way, who was a serving member on the Warren Commission? Alan Dulles, the guy Kennedy had just fired. Again, seems pretty strange. Whether you want to chalk these up to all coincidences or not, you could, but you know we're not in that business. We're in the business of innuendo. We are about slandering, and the beauty part is you cannot slander the dead. They can't sue you. It's awesome. I mean, there's just there there's just too much more about just basically like and like George de Morinchel's whole family. Like his father was involved in George. H.W. Bush's grandfather and like they like they were very influential in put, like like lobbying the government of Woodrow Wilson to get America involved in World War II. They were, <laughs> they were oh very influential God. in reopening get those bonds paid back. They were very uh, influential in reopening the uh, oil fields in Azerbaijan and Baku back to like sort of like a, a American. Oh. Uh, like even after like you know the the Soviets had taken power, like they just talk about full circle there. Yeah, my God, the it's coast like, did that too. I think. Yep. Yeah. I mean, like it just it's just it, the Morin Schultz family. It's like it's like a perfect sort of international mirror to the Bush family, in that they are these sort of zealot figures who just happen to be at the nexus of like these major world events and are like very influential in, in like the oil and intelligence community and, and the cold war. Wait, there's, there's just one thing here about George. I need, I need to share before we wrap it up. Okay. So yeah, uh, before settling in Dallas, he was mainly known as quote, an international businessman, but uh, quoting from Baker here, the timing of his overseas ventures was remarkable. 
Invariably, when he was passing through town, a covert or even overt operation appeared to be unfolding. An invasion, a coup, that sort of thing. For example, in 1961, as exiled Cubans and their CIA support team prepared for the Bay of Pigs invasion in Guatemala, George the Morinschild and his wife passed through Guatemala City on what they told friends was a month-long walking tour of the Central American Isthmus. Then the de Morinschultz appeared in Mexico on oil business just as a Soviet leader arrived on a similar mission, even happened to meet with the communist official. In a third instance, they landed in Haiti shortly after before an unsuccessful coup against its president that the U.S. Finger, US had its fingerprints all over. And uh, just one more thing here. Uh, they also had a connection to William F. Buckley's family and the Venezuelan uh, Pantapec oil firm which was run by William F. Buckley's father, who, of course, uh, the Buckley boys, just like the Bushes, had been in Skull and Bones. And then B William Buckley, like H.W., was a pansy wannabe CIA agent in South America as well. And probably, like George H.W. Bush, William Buckley remained a CIA agent for his entire life. Oh, yeah. To, uh, in order to basically uh, relate the big events of the uh, life and times of George H.W. Bush, we now must consider another rather large figure in American history. And I'm talking, of course, about Richard Milhouse Nixon. and Who was also uh, in Dallas uh, uh, on I will get November to that. 22nd. I will get to that. It's a very, another very weird uh, conf conf confluence of people and events in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. But basically, like where we, where we last left off was George W. Bush, the events leading up to the assassination of JFK, um, all of the strange connections between George H.W. Bush, the Bush family, and many of the peripheral figures in the Kennedy assassination, and to Lee Harvey Oswald himself. Um, I, I'd like to spend most of this episode talking about Watergate, which of that era was probably second only to the Kennedy assassination as like the single biggest news story, news event in like the American presidency and like American politics and culture of that like 60s to 70s period. I mean, it still figures so largely in the American consciousness and particularly in our conception of the role of the media and our sort of valorization of, of journalists. And, you know, basically it is a story that is just a shorthand for holding the powerful to account. Now, what we are going to suggest here in this episode is a, contrar a contrarian reading of Watergate that makes a different case. And I'm not saying you have to... Um, accept it wholeheartedly. I mean, this is, this is a, this is, there are competing narratives out there, but with, once again, indebted to uh, Russ Baker and his book, Family of Secrets, I think it's worth delving into uh, a case he advances as it regards the life of George H.W. Bush, his connection to Watergate, and basically what it really meant and what was really going on with Watergate and Nixon's re resignation. Now, H.W. went from relative obscurity. I mean, you'll remember back in part one, basically, he was uh, working for the Texas Republican Party to support uh, uh, Republican candidates in Texas in the midterm elections of 1964. And like that was his purported reason for being in Texas at the time of the assassination. But it was with largely Nixon's help that H.W. went from relative obscurity to in a not long, not a very long period of time, the heights of power in the Republican Party. Uh, this, this is, of course, despite the facts that we have taped conversations between Nixon and Kissinger and others where they both say they regard H.W. as a lightweight, quote, weak and unqualified for each of the positions that he was eventually given by the Nixon administration. And this is a recurring theme with H.W. This is H.W., similar to his son and similar to many people after, his image of being weak, a nerd, a pushover, that's exactly what he wanted you to see him as. If you remember that uh, 60 Minutes report that we referenced, that you can still find on YouTube, where they ask him, are you too nice to be president? <laughs> <laughs> Which is an amazing question to ask him. Uh, yeah, this is what he wanted. Because if you don't see him as a pushover and lightweight, you see him for what he actually is, which is like, yeah, the, f the fucking Goku of the NWO. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I said, like, um, 
just like uh, the relationship between the Bush and the Nixon family has like eluded most biographies of Nixon. And if you search the indexes in most of the major works, they only turn up a few references to the Bush family or H.W. personally. But if it were not for Nixon, both George H.W. Bush and certainly George W. Bush after them would probably never have become president. So like, so why is that? And the thing is, the, the reason why, despite the fact that like they could not have been more different as people and were not socially clo- or personally close at all, Nixon owed a great deal of his political career to Prescott Bush. And the thing is, like, here's it gets into this thing about Richard Nixon's like psychology and character and personal history. To, to read, I'm just going to quote here from Baker. Um, like basically Nixon's story as a character and a political figure is defined in large part by his feelings of paranoia and resentment towards the Eastern establishment, as, as he called them, who he sold his soul to for power. And, but the thing is, he had a lot of good reasons to be paranoid. And I'm going to quote from Baker here. Generally, Richard Nixon was known to be a wary and a suspicious man. It is commonly assumed that he was paranoid, but Nixon had good reasons to feel apprehensive. One was probably the worry that someone would unearth the extent to which this self-styled outsider from Whittier, California, had sold his soul to the same Eastern establishment that he publicly and even privately reviled. At the same time, He knew that those elites felt the same about him. They tolerated him as long as he was useful, which he was until he got to the top. Then trouble started. So going back to 1966, uh, George H.W. Bush had an unsuccessful run for the Senate. Then, of course, he ultimately won election to the 7th Congressional District of Texas and arrived in D.C., Um, along with the Nixon administration. But he had lost that Senate run, so he was a freshman congressman from Texas. And then immediately was given a seat on the House Ways and Means Committee, which was highly irregular for a freshman congressman. It hadn't happened since 1904. And, well, okay, why? The House Ways and Means Committee was the one of the most important committees in Congress. And for, the, for these people in the Bush family, it was important because House Ways and Means was the gatekeeper, for, or there was a control of something called the Oil Depletion Allowance, which was of basically the highest importance to this new class of sort of southwestern and Texas oil men and all the new wealth that they and the Bushes represented. And keeping that allowance, which was essentially a huge tax giveaway to the oil industry, was the single most important thing to them. So Poppy Bush, H.W., arrives in Washington as basically... The, the oil, the oil men, the new wealth that that like the, the sort of the Texas and Southwestern oil boom represented. And he was a conduit for their money, which would help elect Nixon, would help Nixon win the nomination in 1968. But he was the, standing at the nexus between uh, these Texas oil men, the Eastern establishment and bankers, which, of course, like his family comes from. And, of course, the intelligence community. So in return for that, Texas and like sort of Texans and Bush friends dominated the Nixon presidential campaign. In exchange for fundraising, Poppy, the Poppy Bush recruited all of his former friends and partner, including Zapata Petroleum guys, to become basically the, the, all of the campaign chairman, like the financial chairman of the Nixon campaign. So like the whole, like all, all of these moving, all these parts were just sort of shuffled in there from Bush and his connections to the Nixon campaign to ensure their money, support, et cetera, et cetera. And, the, and like I said, this, this includes a lot of the same people or people who worked for people we talked in episode one as they relate to Zapata Petroleum and other various cutouts and outfits like that. Yeah, uh, George H.W. Was the, was the Eastern point man in uh, the process of bringing that Western oil money into power, uh, bringing them into the tent so that they were no longer uh, like insurgents because that was really what the Goldwater campaign had been, had been this this Western uh, conservative uh, uh, revolt, basically, against the Eastern uh, Dem- Republican Party. And guys like uh, Bush, more than anybody, uh, were there to, to manage their entry into power uh, on the terms of uh, Eastern money, which, of course, is what he always represented first and foremost. Yeah, the story of the latter half of the 20th century, especially on the side of uh, American empire and sides aligned with American uh empire uh, is being a middleman mm. if you remember uh layer cake one more thing young man always remember the art of good business is being a good middleman bye-bye all all great business is being a good middleman and the guys who sort of cemented their place in the latter half of imperial history 
in the second half of the 20th century were the great middlemen. George H.W. Bush, forget anything else, that was his talent. He was a connector piece, and he was the best connector piece there could be. Yeah. But his mere image exists in a lot of other imperial periphery. I mean, Prince Turkey Al Faisal, uh, the key piece in Operation Cyclone and the creation of the Taliban, and by extension Al Qaeda, he was the he was the connecting piece between the CIA, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan's ISI, and then the nascent Taliban. There got, that's if you wanted to establish a political dynasty from about. 1970 on that's what you were because this part of the cold war and this part of imperial arc was all about consolidation yeah and you made your bones by finding out where uh, the points had to be soldered together and being the one who the necessary person uh in those negotiations mm -hmm. and that's exactly who george hw bush was hold on one second get down get down you idiot get down <laughs> <laughs> asshole piece of shit all right so yeah like so how did nixon look at a guy like hw and like the answer is he viewed hw bush poppy as basically someone exactly like jfk he was a handsome young ivy league guy who never had to worry about money and nixon despised him for it so of course he resented like all of the, the the pressure he was under to name him as his running mate and once he locked up the nomination of course then that's when he bucked Prescott and like, you know, the gang of 100 by naming Agnew as his guy. But in exchange for that, he knew he had to soothe these people. Um, so he had to make amends with that gang. So in exchange for not choosing H.W. Bush, he ended up staffing his cabinet with their creatures. And I'm talking like, I'm going down a list of like former Zapata oil member, uh, so former Zapata petroleum guys, uh, lawyers from Baker Botts, all Bush campaign guys, all close friends of Poppy, the Bush family. And wouldn't you know it, a lot of these guys, and like there are too many to name, and I can't get into the details around all of them, but a lot of these same people would play covert to outright roles in the events that led to the downfall and resignation of Richard Nixon. One of the only guys in Nixon's White House who was not in this crew was Henry Kissinger, of course. And Kissinger was a longtime protege of Nelson of the Rockefellers and was known as an internationalist. Um, he was suspect on both the left and right, but movement conservatives basically hated that the Rockefellers had this global design that included accommodation rather than confrontation with uh, the Russians and the Chinese. And Nixon, as president, was always caught at the intersection of this uh, power struggle within the right wing about vis-a-vis -vis, like the, the Cold War, China, free trade, and things like that. And of course, he like Nixon as a as a as a person was definitely more at ease with the kind of like the the hawks and the warriors and like the the right wingers, but he worked diligently to please both sides as much as he could. But the crucial thing that he did early on in his presidency is that he basically he let Kissinger basically set up his own foreign policy outfit that yeah. bypassed, in Nixon's words, the striped pants faggots at Foggy Foggy Bottom. <laughs> So and like it's hard to un it's hard to like this is monumentally important here because basically he cut out the defense not just the State Department but the defense and military establishment from foreign policy and created all these like back channels to run it out of the White House and not the State Department the DOD Langley and everything that that entails. So what did they do? Well, they began to set up their own back channels and shadow governments within Nixon's own White House as he was doing that to to them. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The, 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 the secretaries of defense and state basically had nothing to do during the entirety of the uh, of the Nixon uh, administration. They were like playing fucking pinochle with each other the whole time because they were it was just him and Kissinger in a room, which is not how it's supposed to work. Like <laughs> these the, like guy, the presidency is only uh, imbued with the power it is with the expectation that that power is going to be, you know, uh, uh, deliberated and delegated out through the network of people who can be trusted and who are part of a, of these existing structures. Uh, Nixon just deciding to do it himself uh, was in incredibly alarming. So, and then there was there was a second snub of H. W. Bush that Nixon did um, in 1968. Uh, Poppy tried to run for the Senate again, 
in Texas, but he was defeated when uh, the conservative Democrat Lloyd Benson got in the race and on the Democratic side, ran and then defeated. He, he lost to him. But um, so he, after losing that Senate bid, he, wa- he asked Nixon if he could be undersecretary of the Treasury. It's strange that he would ask for that job rather than full-on secretary. But keep in mind, as Baker points out, the undersecretary of the Treasury Department was the job that specifically dealt with the oil industry. And once again, that oil depletion allowance. Um, But Nixon dissed him again and appointed somebody else. And Bush was once again, H.W. was livid about this. What did all this loyalty to Nixon really get him if he can't even be undersecretary of the Treasury? And he also basically suspected, and rightly so, that Nixon uh, supported Lloyd Benson and was basically forming his own alliance with uh, sort of very conservative Southern Democrats like Benson and Senator Eastland and guys like that to be like a a block of support for Nixon and his policies that would be outside the realm of the gang, the cabal, the Bushes, and, and the oil industry and the Eastern elites. So this brings us to like these are all the these are all the threads that are coalescing, which bring us to the the Watergate burglary itself. Now, basically, in Baker's book, he he advances a narrative that suggests that basically everything about the popular understanding of Watergate and Nixon's role in it is wrong. So let's examine that itself. So let's let's begin with the break in itself. Um, on June 17, 1972, a group of burglars carrying electronic surveillance equipment was arrested inside the Democratic National Committee offices um, at the Watergate building complex. The men were quickly identified as having ties to the Nixon re-election campaign and the White House. Baker writes here, Almost no one has better expressed reasons to doubt Nixon's involvement than Nixon himself. In his memoir, Nixon described how he learned about the burglary while vacationing in Florida from the morning newspaper. He recalled his reaction at the time. It sounded preposterous. This is, this is Nixon writing. Cubans in surgical gloves bugging the DNC. I dismissed it as some sort of prank. The whole thing made so little sense. Why, I wondered. Why then? Why in such a blundering way? Anyone who knew anything about politics would know that the National Committee headquarters was a useless place to go for inside information on the presidential campaign. The whole thing looked so senseless and bungled that it almost looked like it was some kind of setup. Now, and just from the very beginning, Nixon suspected that not only was this a setup, but this was a setup of him. And then uh, we, we have another from like the Nixon tapes we have um, on, on the 23rd, which is very, very shortly thereafter the burglary. And on June 23rd, uh, Alderman says to Nixon that he's been co- you know, sort of coordinating with the FBI agents working on this case. And in his opinion, the whole thing, in the opinion of the FBI that he was talking to, the whole thing smelled of the CIA. That this was like they had, they had, they had basically stumbled upon unwittingly an ongoing CIA operation. To which Nixon, when told of this, says, "Of course, this is this is a E. Howard Hunt operation, and the exposure of it will uncover a lot of things. You open that scab, there's a hell of a lot of things that we just feel that it would be very detrimental." to have this go any further. This involves the Cubans, Hunt, and a lot of hanky-panky that we have nothing to do with ourselves. This will open the whole Bay of Pigs thing. And it's that phrase, the Bay of Pigs thing, that comes up again and again and again in Nixon's own recordings of himself and in the literature on this. What did, to Nixon, the Bay of Pigs thing really represent? So... Nixon felt immediately like he was being set up. And again, there are many good reasons why Nixon would be advancing a case that sought to exonerate himself about this. Like, you have to take this into account when considering, you know, various competing versions of these events. But basically, the burglary itself seemed intentionally amateurish, even though it was carried out by absolute pros. And from his first day in office... Like Nixon knew that many of his supporters or the people who had put him in the White House were unhappy with him, particularly the right wing. And as I mentioned, these, this all concerns his attempts to thaw out the Cold War, using Kissinger to bypass the, the, the military, the defense establishment, the State Department. And basically, like his attempts to secure agreements to the Soviet Union and China without the consent of the military and the oil men who thought he wasn't delivering enough for them on as it related to the depletion allowance or import quotas. So when Nixon says the Howard Hunt thing and talked about opening that scab, he meant the Bay of Pigs and the CIA. So one of the, one of like the smoking guns 
um, that indicted Nixon in the public imagination and in Congress was like the, the smoking gun tape on June 23rd. And it was a conversation between Haldeman and Nixon where Haldeman says, the way to handle this now is for us to have CIA director, deputy director Vernon Wal Walters call the FBI interim director, Pat Gray, and just say, stay the hell out of this. This is a business here that we don't want you to go any further on. Nixon says, mm-hmm. And an excerpt like that is damning, but in almost every account of the smoking gun tape, they don't go, they don't play what happened immediately after that tape. And that was basically Alderman and Nixon saying that they had stumbled inadvertently into an ongoing open CIA operation. So like what, what seems like they're indicting themselves is actually they are they're flabbergasted that they are going to have to take the blame for something that is being done to them rather than on their orders by the CIA. And this is crucial because it's like it's not like Nixon was like a critic of the CIA in the sense that you or I would be like he had his own reasons for this and he was in collusion with all the same people. But the thing is, he knew them. He was their creature. And. He had his own motivations is like his own power to consider. And he was terrified of that Bay of Pigs things and what it really represented. And, and another fictional account of Nixon's presidency is Oliver Stone's Nixon. And in Stone's portray portrayal of it, similar to like the Robert Altman Gang of 100 thing, Nixon talks again and again about the Bay of Pigs thing. And he refers to it as the beast. This 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 nexus of like sh like shadow government and power that was not that was that was created of course to assassinate Castro and to like overthrow the Cuban Revolution but took on a life of its own that 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 was that was something much much darker than just a like a a covert warfare against Cuba it represented something much bigger in Nixon's mind than just a a failed invasion of Cuba. Now, on June twenty third, nineteen seventy two. This is the same day Nixon instructed Haldeman to tell the CIA director, Richard Helms, to rein in the FBI's Watergate investigation. Haldeman, in his own uh, recollection of events, says this. In his meeting with Helms, he says, I played Nixon's trump card. The president asked me to tell you this entire affair may be connected to the Bay of Pigs, and if it opens up, the Bay of Pigs might be blown turmoil in the room, Helms gripping the arms of his chair, leaning forward and shouting, the Bay of Pigs had nothing to do with this. I have no concern about the Bay of Pigs. I was absolutely shocked by Helms' violent reaction. Again, I wondered what was such dynamite in the Bay of Pigs story. And, you know, Nixon, throughout, like, again, throughout his entire presidency, was totally paranoid that the CIA had infiltrated his cabinet, like his White House. And, you know, I think there are probably good reasons for him to believe that. Uh, Baker writes here that in all likelihood, the practice of filling the White House with intelligence operatives was not limited to the Nixon administration, but was an ongoing effort. To the intelligence community, the White House was no different than other civil institutions it actively penetrated. In Baker's book, there's a long digression about how Nixon himself also ended up in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. He was there to speak at Pepsi Cola's corporate meeting and convention. And there's a lot of like spook and agency connections as it relates to the cola industry and of course Cuban sugar. But I gotta skip it all here and I just need to note simply that LBJ, Nixon, and George H.W. Bush, three future presidents, were all in Dallas on that day. And then of course Gerald Ford was appointed to the Warren Commission three days later. So that's four future American presidents presidents who all get a close-up look at one serving president getting his head blown off, all with varying degrees of incrimination in that murder and the people involved in it. So, like, j just think about what that actually represents. That they, like, for some reason, they, like, like those, all those future American presidents were, like, had a front row seat to see Kennedy get his fucking head blown off in Dallas. Do you think that that might have led to Nixon's paranoia about the CIA and the the Bay of Pigs thing, considering who was involved in the Bay of Pigs, yeah, it's highly likely. Uh, I mean, it, it, you don't even have to 
taken his word for it about Watergate. The guys were fucking CIA operatives. They were all, they were Bay of Pigs veterans. Uh, and speaking of the incompetence of the Watergate uh, burglary, the thing that always gets me is that the whole reason it got blown is because a security guard passed by a door that had a piece of tape over the lock, which is a classic way that you, you know, keep a door open. But the way you do it, if you don't want to get caught, is you do it uh, so that the tape uh, lies along the uh, angle of the door uh, vertically so you don't see it from the side. But it was taped horizontally so you could see it poking out on either side of the door. And the first thing that the security guard did, because he was probably getting paid minimum wage, was just take it off and w- walk away. But then he came back and someone had put it back exactly in the same spot which I don't know how the hell you keep your job for five minutes if you keep doing that. And here's the thing, like the guys who did it, the guys who did the Watergate burglary, like, and back to the, like the, the actual event itself, like Matt brings up the, the obvious question and Nixon himself was wondering about this. Why all the obvious fuck ups in a job that's being carried out by agency pros? These guys like Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy and like the Cubans they were working with were not just they were veterans of the Bay of Pigs operation, but like it, many of them individually would go on to do Phoenix program shit in Vietnam. These people were professional killers who had done this very thing many times before, but then did the Watergate burglary in such a way that not only was the, like, the break-in discovered by a fucking minimum wage security guard, but that immediately there was an abundance of evidence linking the men involved, not just to the White House and the committee to re-elect the president, but the CIA, and not just the CIA, but parts of the agency who were behind the Bay of Pigs. And guess who else was in Dallas on that day in 1963? That's right, Howard Hunt, which was confirmed as such by CIA all-star James Jesus Angleton in 1978. Now, at the time of the Watergate breakdown, keep in mind that the guys like Hunt and McCord were, of course, resigned from the CIA. I mean, and if you believe that, go back and listen to part one about the way the agency uses resignations before putting guys into, like, active black ops situations. Yeah, no, the one thing about the CIA... It's like the mafia. You always leave when you say you leave. Very easy to get out of. Now, Hunt was working for the White House. But this is another interesting detail. While he was in the White House, Hunt went to outlandish, took outlandish efforts to broadcast to like anyone who was paying attention that he was continued to be involved with the CIA. He ordered government limousines to drive him from the White House to Langley, signaling to everyone that Nix, the Nixon White House was closely tied to the CIA at the exact moment that they were actually feuding with it. And, the, and Nixon was feuding with the, the CIA over the declassification of everything that they had related to the Bay of Pigs invasion. Nixon, as soon as he got in the White House, he, he, he wanted to know what was going on with the Bay of Pigs thing because he correctly understood it as a direct threat to his power as president and like a demonstration of just what this secret government can do to you if you step out of line. He, like, so like he was being blackballed at the, by the CIA about their documents at the very same time that this burglary is carried out by the very same people who did the Bay of Pigs. Interesting. Interesting, to say the least. Yeah, and the thing is, is that people resist that because you, if you say that Nixon was kind of framed in this thing, it kind of implies that Nixon was some sort of, was innocent in some broad sense. But when you're dealing with people at this level of power, innocent is not a thing. Like, there, he did create the plumbers. He did authorize all kinds of wild anti-democratic shit, wiretapping and breaking and entering like Daniel Ellsberg's uh, psychiatrist's office, things like that. But uh, that really just provides the perfect context to fuck with him. You don't have to necessarily execute a guy who's that reckless and that willing to expose himself if you know what he's doing. And now you, you bring up you bring it up, you bring up the Ellsberg office thing. But like these same people before the Watergate burglary that got discovered, like weeks prior to that, that that wasn't even the first time they they broke into the the Watergate. They the first time they did it, they did it to plant um, listening devices in the DNC offices, and they were you know strangely 
uh, not discovered during that break-in. And the second Watergate break-in was ostensibly to remove those same listening devices. And they had done a similar thing in 1971. You mentioned the break-in at Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, which is another strange job for these people, as there were no actual medical records or like patient notes in the office. And they made no attempt to even find them or hide that a break-in had occurred. Um, but a criminal report was nonetheless generated. And even though the break-in was not ordered by Nixon, it was already connected to him before he was even aware of it. And what it was revealed was, of course, deeply damaging to his public stand standing and establishes a kind of pattern of these, these fucked up, botched break-ins done by fucking contract killers for the CIA who seemingly make every effort to be discovered and announce to everyone that they had done a break-in on behalf of Richard Nixon. So, I mean, like, there, there's a lot of stuff that I don't have time to get into here about, like, a lot of these peripheral figures to Watergate, like uh, Butterfield, uh, Lowell Weicker, and the prosecutor Leon Jarowski, that, like, if you're interested in sussing out all of their connections to H.W. Bush and the CIA, uh, just read Family of Secrets. But there's, there's too much to get into here. Um, but basically... One of the big issues was um, something called the Townhouse Fund, which was like a proto-Watergate that like happened before these events that also tied Nixon to like shady financial dealings. And that the lead prosecutor uh, uh, that was appointed by Congress, Leon Jarowski, George W. H. W. Bush called him at a crucial moment and told him that it had been determined that uh, both H.W. Bush and Jarowski himself were recipients of funds that came out of this townhouse scandal so that they were both implicated in it. And no one followed that money. Like the follow the money is like the is is the catchphrase about Watergate. And there was all of these like sources of money relating that went into Watergate as it related to George W. Bush and a lot of like Texas oil money that was never followed up on. And in 1974, as efforts to remove him from office gained steam, uh, Nixon's Justice Department was, in fact, also looking into antitrust violations among these exact same oil men as it related to uh, their, their monopolistic practices. And this is happening at the exact same time. So basically, everyone around Nixon, like John Dean, John Dean's lawyers, uh, Jaworski, all these people worked in, in various ways and to like in depending on how you read this with varying degrees of collusion to undermine Nixon in the public eye and to and to basically uh sell him out to just to, you know just point to him. It was him. He was the guy who did it. He he ordered all he ordered the, all the Watergate thing. Just basically like as as Nixon as the Nixon White House came crashing down, George H. W. Bush was a guy was like the only guy who managed to maintain complete disconnection from all of the dirty shit that had now become synonymous with the Nixon administration. He, he got away scot-free in the media and in Congress in every way. He, he emerged from it totally unscathed, which is odd. In fact, he got uh, a reputation. I remember reading uh, uh, What It Takes, which is this gigantic book about the 1988 presidential campaign that has sections on all the, uh, all the people who ran. And uh, the, the takeaway, the narrative around... Uh, Poppy was that he had been selfless during this period, that he had that he had been chairman of the RNC at a time when people were very suspicious of it, and then later he became chairman uh, head of the CIA at a time when it, people were very suspicious of it, and that his choice to do that was essentially self-sacrificing. So after Nixon leaves office, once again, Poppy is pushed hard to be Gerald Ford's VP, and Ford ultimately does pass on HW, but he does, but he did make him. Envoy to China. Now, again, he had no experience with China, but keep in mind that this is, a, this is happening exactly like at the exact same time that Nixon and Kissinger had just opened up China. And like I said, had begun a process of, as the saying goes, only Nixon can go to China. What that really means is only Nixon could have, the ardent anti-communist that he was, only he would have been allowed to basically begin to wrap up and end the Cold War and reach like a, a diplomatic, you know, treat Soviet, the Soviet Union and communist China as nations that should be negotiated with just like any other. And then all of a sudden, H.W. Bush becomes the special envoy to China under the Ford administration. And, you know, of course, then immediately Ford pardons Richard Nixon. But the important thing about that is that the pardon of Nixon for the crimes related to Watergate, the fact that he was pardoned for it forever tied him to those crimes. And crucially, ended all investigations into who exactly was involved. And then George H.W. Bush was, of course, sent away to China. 
<laughs> as far away from the scene of the crime as you could get. And like, like I said, like this all paints a portrait of Watergate and Nixon's resolution as a, co- as a, a covert operation to um, set up Nixon, make sure that he was like, you know, framed for it, guilty of it, and to remove any of their fingerprints from what happened. Again, like it's you. You can like th- th- this is this is a narrative. I mean, like there, you, I'm sure there are ways you could you could argue against it, but I, I I do think it's an interesting one and one, like you know that that basically Nixon was the victim of Watergate rather than its perpetrator. And what was really going on here was not, you know, Nixon as like a evil conniving guy, though he was. It was him being removed from power for bucking like his backers, his sponsors, the people who owned him. And if you consider how Kennedy's presidency ended up and the things that he did to anger these very same people, I mean, it was another basically, and a lot of like Nixon's right-wing toadies have gone on to describe it as a coup and like they have very self-interested reasons for doing so, but they may not be entirely wrong. Yeah, but they yes, wrong for the right reasons. That's pretty much the only way anybody in any of these like partisan boxes can ever uh, be correct. So now it's it's 1974, and in 1974, thanks to the efforts of Seymour Hersh, the American public had finally become aware of what was known as the CIA family jewels. This included all of the information and documentation about their assassinations, spying on American journalists, experiments on human guinea pigs, run down the fucking list. So there was like an increased interest, not just in the CIA and their role in assassinations, but there being an, inter- an interest in the Kennedy assassination as well. And there was a great deal of public outcry about this at the time. And in response to it, Gerald Ford created something called the Rockefeller Commission, which released one report in 1975, which was a pure limited hangout that talked to basically like cop to the CIA's mail opening and their spying on domestic political groups. But it also concluded that there was, quote, no credible evidence of CIA's involvement in the JFK assassination. However, before the Rockefeller Commission could release its report, they were immediately undercut by the Church Committee, which is a dueling, competing congressional like uh, hearing or like, like investigation that was launched by Senate Democrats, which absolutely blew away the Rockefeller Commission's whitewash of these things. Uh, Quoting here, it says, the church committee documented a mind-boggling array of domestic dirty tricks. The CIA and FBI would send anonymous letters designed to induce employers to fire politically suspect workers. Similar letters were sent to spouses in an effort to destroy marriages. The committee also documented criminal break-ins and disinformation campaigns aimed at provoking violent attacks against selected individuals, including Martin Luther King Jr. The FBI also mailed King a tape recording taken from microphones hidden in his hotel rooms, accompanied by a note warning that the recording, with its evidence of marital indiscretions, would be released to the public unless King committed suicide. So because of the church committee, Ford had to issue an executive order banning U.S. sanctioned assassinations of foreign leaders. And, you know, if you were aware of any of this at the time, the echo to the Kennedy assassination could not be unmistaken in in this effort to finally say that, like, okay, according to, like, by executive fiat, the U.S. intelligence community can no longer assassinate the leaders of foreign countries. But, you know, unspoken in there is, like, what about leaders of our own country, right? Hmm. So... Frank Church, who was uh, the Idaho Democratic senator, um, it, you know, beginning in January of 1975, just unearthed one scandal after another about the CIA, the FBI, and the National Security Agency. Uh, you know, run down the list here. And it was like, you know, shocking for the public. And there was like a huge amount of pressure being placed on politicians to rein in the intelligence community and crucially to reopen an investigation into the Kennedy assassination. In March 1975, the American public saw the Zapruder film for the first time ever. And this was, of course, after Henry Luce bought the film for the express purpose of making sure no one ever saw it. On November 1st of that year, George H.W. Bush is in Beijing with Barbara, and he gets a telegram from Kissinger that Ford is about to name him CIA director. Now, the timing of this is crucial. Like, It's really hard to overstate just how damaging the church committee's efforts were to the intelligence community and just how scared for probably the first time ever they were of any kind of public revelation or accountability for basically running a secret government and they committed heinous crimes like i said like even in the church committee what they were able to pry out of them was i guarantee you only a fraction 
of the atrocities that they got up to it, it, but prior to that era. So all of a sudden, they're bringing back H.W. Bush from China and making him director of the CIA. And, and of course, when he was nominated, he was praised as being an outsider. He was praised because, oh, he has no, he's never worked in the intelligence community. So like, we're going to bring in a guy to clean house, some guy outside of, their, of, that, of that sphere and social world. But, you know, as we've outlined on these, both of these episodes frequently, that is complete horseshit. They could not have picked a guy who was more of an insider at this very crucial moment when the CIA, for like the first time in its existence, was under unprecedented pressure to be reformed or to be shut down even. That was a real, like people forget, like that was a real political issue at the time. Like they, they got very close to like through, through Congress of like openly asking the question, should we have a CIA given what we know about them and like the, the revelations as it pertains to their behavior in undermining not just foreign governments and democracy, but their actions right here at home, which explicitly go against the, their charter, which says that they can only operate outside the United States. So at that exact moment, George H.W. Bush is made or nominated to be director of the CIA to replace William Colby, who was the guy who released these family jewels in an effort, it, that, a limited hangout effort, that, which even for them was still too forthcoming for the people in power. And it was followed by what was called the Halloween Massacre, which uh, in the Ford administration, which sort of battened down the hatches on everyone in intelligence who was considered disloyal. The two guys in charge of the Halloween Massacre, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld. Wop. To get confirmed by the Senate, um, George, George H.W. Bush had to sort of, he had to run a gauntlet. And there's an interesting piece uh, by James Risen in The Intercept not too long ago that talks about how uh, basically there was a, an assassination of a CIA officer in Greece at the time. And then they used that, that assassination and like that dead guy as like a way to get him confirmed. And they were sort of waving the bloody flag to be like, our, our patriotic overseas CIA officers are being murdered and like at the same time that the church committee is attacking them and the work they do, and that they, he may have even been killed because of the church committee. And they began blaming this good death of this guy. Uh, his name was uh, Richard Welch. He was the CIA station chief in Greece, and he was uh, assassinated in Athens in 1975. And the CIA, of course, immediately began be blaming his death on the, on the church committee in a sensational and hysterical way. That, you know, that, oh, like these investigations led to this death. And it was that climate that basically helped Bush get confirmed by the Senate. On January 27th, 1976, Senator Strom Thurmond argued for his confirmation by claiming to, that the public was more concerned by disclosures that are tearing down the CIA than by the selection of this highly competent man to repair the damage of this overexposure. But People forget George H.W. Bush only lasted one year as CIA director. He was only there for one year before Ford lost Carter, and he tried to get Carter to keep him on as CIA director, but I guess even Jimmy Carter was smart enough to know that he didn't get this, get this guy the fuck out of there. <laughs> One of the only smart moves Carter made. Yeah, 100%. But in that year that he was, I mean, like I said, like it's the timing of it that's so important because he was, he was made director at a very, very vulnerable time for the CIA. And what did he do during the one year he was director of the CIA? Well, he announced a major reorganization that increased both the agency's authority to conduct controversial operations and the director's authority over the larger intelligence community. So, like, he was there, and then, like, along with, guess what, Rumsfeld, Cheney, and Wolfowitz, and others who did the Halloween massacre, he began ways uh, of finding ways to get around analysts who did not sufficiently hype the threat from the Soviet Union. What was that effort? It was, of course, known as Team A and Team B in the Pentagon. And that Team A, Team B guy, look that up. It is everyone who was like the neocons who started the war in Iraq. And like the whole, their whole, the, the, their whole reason for being was to create non-existent, a non-existent threat by the Soviet Union to uh, abrogate any effort to cut military spending or to rein in the intelligence community. Because they would always come up with like, well, uh, the CIA or the State Department says that there is absolutely no evidence we can find that the Soviet Union is currently developing a doomsday device. And Team B would look at the same evidence 
and create this like stovepipe of intelligence exactly like they did in the, the George W. Bush administration to say, well, the fact that there is no evidence for the Russian doomsday device is proof positive that Russia is developing a doomsday device because we understand the Russian mind in a way that these people don't. It, sh it should be noted that not a single one of these people spoke Russian or ever lived in Russia, even once. So he was right there, and Brent Snowcroft was right there. It was, like, it was this very, like, brief period in the Ford administration, a guy who was, like, not even elected president, in, in which the intelligence community and George H.W. Bush managed to completely reassert control over, like, the CIA and all of their covert operations at a time when it was most vulnerable, and then right before Reagan got in there and gave them free reign to do whatever the fuck they wanted. But also, we saw here, like, this is the beginning of the careers of guys like Cheney, Rumsfeld, Snowcroft, Snowcroft and everyone who would be in George H.W. Bush's presidential administration, and then eventually his sons. And there's one other uh, big notable thing uh, from his brief tenure there at CIA. While he was the CIA uh, chief, uh, Orlando Ledier and Ronnie Moffat were blown up in DuPont Circle by uh, the Chilean security services as part of Operation Condor, uh, and he publicly uh, helped cover it up. So the involvement that he had there, who knows how deep that went. And then finally, most importantly, the one thing he also did in his brief tenure as CIA director was put an end to any and all investigations into the JFK assassination and the numerous agency connections to literally everyone involved in it, especially old family friend George de Schultz, who we talked about in episode one. This, at this exact moment, journalists began digging around this guy. And what do you know it? In 1977, he blew his head off with a shotgun. Well, Bill O'Reilly was at front, his front door. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Uh, that, that takes us from, H w, from the Watergate burglary and like HW's involvement in the Nixon administration right up to his tenure as CIA director. And by special, I mean, how can we... How can I finally placate our hog fans who've been bothering me about this for what feels like 10 years now? But I don't know if you noticed or not uh, the button that I'm wearing right now, but for those in the back, it says, re-elect Barbara's husband in 1992. That's right, Dallas, we're talking the Kennedy assassination, so for you guys here tonight, we are premiering part three of Poppy. <laughs> The greatest Texan of all time, George H.W. Bush. I think we'd all agree. <laughs> the Texan's Texan, they called him. The most Texan. Uh, under direct CIA director George H.W. Bush, uh, leaked for public cons consumption through Newsweek magazine, he uh, uh, leaked a, a, an intelligence assessment to Newsweek magazine, clearing the Chilean government's feared intelligence service, DINA, which was then run by Contreras, who was like a, another very scary guy. Relying on the word of Bush's CIA, Newsweek reported that the Chilean secret police were not involved in the Letelier assassination. The central, agency, the central intelligence agency reached its decision because the bomb was too crude to be the work of experts, and because the murder, coming while, the murder was coming while Chile, Chile's rulers were worrying, wooing U.S. support. It could only damage the Santiago regime. Operation Condor, just a side note, had the benefit for Ameri sickos on the American side in that it was like the greatest direct mail child theft ring probably of all time. Was it like John Negroponte when he was ambassador to Honduras was running a, a child adoption racket? Yeah. Of like pe orphans who were made by the dirty war that he was running. He was selling to American families through the U.S. Embassy in, in Honduras. Yeah, yeah. There were, there's been a lot of a, uh, a lot of media made about the theft of babies, specifically in Argentina. But they were doing it everywhere. The Condor was. Uh, one last thing about uh, CIA contractor Michael Towney, who planted the car bomb, and this is another sort of another thing that rhymes with the career of George H. W. Bush and his entire family. Would, would, it, would it surprise you to learn that Michael Towney was on the State Department's watch list for international terrorism, but was allowed to enter the country more or less <laughs> completely unmolested? <laughs> Does yeah. that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, and, and so the CIA, when the CIA said uh, that, oh, no, uh, the Chileans, they didn't do this. We know. Trust us. W who did it? Their argument was it was communists who were trying to make Letelier a martyr. <laughs> it's like they were imagining an international communist movement where they're like, hey, Orlando, would you willing to, like, 
would you be willing to die, like, for clout? <laughs> and he was like, absolutely. But unfortunately, Orlando Letelier, uh, Orlando Letelier wasn't the only assassination causing a headache for Poppy. There was still the matter of Dallas in 1963 for him to nail shut. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a quote now from uh, Russ Baker's book. Although Poppy couldn't remember where he has, had been on November 22nd, 1963. Who could? And couldn't, and couldn't be bothered to recall his old friend, George de Morinschultz's precise Who's role. Who's that? In the matter and, or in the life of Lee Harvey Oswald, as CIA director, he began paying keen attention to the resurgent assassination investigations. So uh, Poppy composed an internal memo asking after a report regarding a visit by Jack Ruby, this Jack Ruby to Santo Traficante. <laughs> uh, it says, uh, Traficante, uh, two years after Bush left the CIA as director, would admit to congressional investigators of being part of a CIA, CIA operation to assassinate Castro in the 1960s, in 1960. As a side note, I didn't know this until I was researching it for the show today. Sam Giancana was killed in 1975 by an unknown gunman shortly before he was set to testify to the church committee about it's his true. role in the many plots against Castro. He was cooking sausage and peppers. So he came up and bing, 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 right in the head. Just a little bit like a, like a, a little bit of like ma the mafia flavor to the Kennedy assassination here. Uh, just another quote it says here. Uh, later the committee decided, this is uh, speaking of, um, uh, uh, Tra Traficante said he was brought into the Castro thing by uh, Johnny Roselli. And he uh, tested his later committee, decided to recall Roselli for additional testimony when he was called up. But by the time he was called, he had already been missing for several days. His decomposing body was later found yep. inside a 55 in a gallon drum, steel fuel drum. drum floating in Tampa Bay. <laughs> floating yeah. in Dumbfounding Bay near yeah. Miami. Yeah. He had been strangled and shot, and his legs had been sawed off. It is really sad when someone wants to kill themselves that badly. <laughs> Just really unfortunate. Call your friends, call your therapist, call any girl that you see. Just don't end up like him. In his testimony to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, Traficante would say he had, he had been recruited for the Castro Project by fellow mobster John Roselli, who had testified in 1975 before the church, committees, uh, the church Committee about efforts to kill Castro. In April 1976, while Poppy was CIA director, Roselli was again called before the Church Committee, this time to testify about the conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. Then the oil drum thing happened. Then... <laughs> But there was just one loose thread that dangled out in front this of Poppy this entire time. And that is his old family friend, George DeMorenschult, from yeah. right here in Dallas, Texas. In, the case, in case you don't remember, George DeMorenschult was a Russian-born petroleum engineer who's like a Zeleg figure to the whole Kennedy assassination. Uh, he was basically, uh, he was the uncle of President po of Poppy's prep school roommate at Andover. He was a friend of First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy's parents, an associate of Oswald, a notorious womanizer and bon vivant who is rejected by the wartime, offices of oh, wartime Office of Strategic Service for his alleged Nazi sympathies. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, uh, George de Schultz was the guy who, uh, like, longtime family friends with the Bush family. He has known Poppy since he was in high school, pretty much. And he keeps showing up in the life of Poppy H.W. Bush. And he shows up here in Dallas because he basically is the, basically shepherds Lee Harvey Oswald and his Russian wife Marina. He shepherds them into this community of Dallas white Russians and became like their sort of social confidant, a very close friend of theirs. Uh, Demoren Schultz's wife, uh, Jeanne, uh, she was the one who claimed to have taken the photo of Oswald in the backyard, if you believe that photo was actually taken. <laughs> in... Okay, so, but in, uh, while this is going on, in September of 1976, there's a, basically like a, a growing, uh, after the church committee, a growing drumbeat of public interest, not just in the assassination of John F. Kennedy, but also in Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and Robert Kennedy. So after months of debate, the House agreed to open a new investigation into all of them, hence the House Select Committee on Assassinations. January of that year, so the beginning of the year, like September is when the House Select Committee on Assassinations is finally formed. In January of that year, George de Morinschel had written to a Dutch TV reporter named William, Willem, Ot, Willem Altmans, 
who had struck up a friendship with uh, George years earlier in Dallas when he was speaking to these like women, women's auxiliary groups that were like these fanatically arch conservative Bircher types. Uh, and also, sidebar here about Willem Altman's. He was, uh, he did attend Yale and graduated in the same class as William F. Buckley. So like all these people know each other. It's really amazing. So, so like, so he's talking to this guy, Altman's, who is this weird, he's if, like in, in the writing about him, he's described sort of similar to George de and Schultz himself as sort of an intelligence connected cipher. So he, he, knows, uh, he knows that, that George de and Schultz is working on a memoir that he's seeking this Dutch TV reporter's help with. So Morenschild is beginning to lose it. And later that year, he wrote this letter to George H.W. Bush, who was serving as the director of the CIA. This is an incredible letter that he wrote his old friend George. It's dated Dallas, September 5th. Dear George, you will excuse this handwritten letter. Maybe you will be able to bring a solution to the hopeless situation I find myself in. My wife and I find ourselves surrounded by some vigilantes. Our phone bugged and we are being followed everywhere. Either FBI is involved in this or they do not want to accept my complaints. We are driven to insanity by the situation. I have been behaving like a damn fool ever since my daughter Nadja died from cystic fibrosis over three years ago. I tried to write stupidly and unsuccessfully about Lee H. Oswald and, mu and it must have angered a lot of people. I do not know, but to punish an elderly man like myself and my highly nervous and sick wife is really too much. Could you do something to remove the net around us? This will be my last request for help, and I will not annoy you anymore. Good luck in your important job. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sincerely, George DeMorenschild, 2737 Kings Road, apartment 142, if anyone wants to check that out. <laughs> First floor apartment, pretty tough for a JFK co-conspirator. <laughs> You have to, like, you have to fuck up so bad to have, like, known Bush your entire life, to have helped kill Kennedy, and you end up being this guy. It's like Joe Biden's dad missing out on the great wave of post-war prosperity. Two of the biggest bag fumbles of all time. So, obviously, this, this letter hits, like, the CIA's, um, like, mail department. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just want to say... Where Ari Gold was working. <laughs> I just want to say, if I ever get the chance to write a letter to a secretary-level individual, I'm absolutely going to sign it off. Good luck with your important job. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's like a pestering Jewish mom. So, like, imagine, like, yeah, you're, you're in the CIA mail department, and you get a handwritten letter from a guy speaking, you know, on very friendly terms with the director of the CIA, and the guy happens to be a guy who is, like, more associated with the Kennedy assassination than anyone other than Lee Harvey Oswald. So it's, like, routed around the agency, and, like, all these notes are appended to it. And then it, like, it finally gets across Director Bush's desk with, uh, with, with this memo. Mr. Bush, do you know this individual? <laughs> This is a side note to the director. And then uh, in, in an internal CIA note, uh, George H.W. Bush responded, I do know this man, DeMorin Schilt. I first met him in the early 40s. He was an uncle to my Andover roommate. Later, he surfaced in Dallas in the 50s, maybe? <laughs> he got involved in some controversial dealings in Haiti. Then he surfaced when Oswald shot to prominence. He knew Oswald before the assassination of President Kennedy. So that's like, I love that response because this is the head of the CIA who uh, doesn't really recall much of anything about a close family friend who was that close to the guy who supposedly killed the president. But he refers to his controversial dealings in Haiti. I love that that's like such intelligence OPSEC because he's talking about like, well, I recall he did some controversial things in Haiti and not the vastly more controversial dealings with Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> so George Bush, director of the CIA, actually penned a personal response to George. It reads as such. Dear George, please forgive the delay in my reply to your September 5th letter. It took time to thoroughly explore the matters you raised. Let me first say that I know it must have been difficult for you to seek my help in the situation outlined in your letter. I believe I can appreciate your state of mind in view of your daughter's tragic death a few years ago and the current poor state of your wife's health. I was extremely sorry to hear of these circumstances. In your situation, I can well imagine how the attentions you described in your letter affect both you and your wife. 
However, my staff has been unable to find any indication of interest in your activities on the part of federal authorities in recent years. The flurry of interest that has attended your testimony before the Warren Commission has long since subsided. I can only suspect that you have become newsworthy, in quotation marks again, and in view of the renewed interest in the Kennedy assassination and thus may be attracting the attention of people in the media. I hope this letter has been of some comfort to you, George, although I realize I am unable to answer your question completely. Thank you for your good wishes on my new job. As you can imagine, I'm finding it interesting and challenging. <laughs> Very truly yours, George Bush, director. <laughs> okay, so Dallas, Texas, would it surprise you to learn that George Gamoran Schultz's life took a turn for the worse after sending the director of the CIA? What? <laughs> no, but he asked his old friend for help. In November of that year, just one month after writing the letter, uh, George's wife had him committed to a mental institution for three months at where? Dallas Parkland Hospital. That's right. <laughs> you might remember Parkland as the hospital Kennedy was rushed to after getting his head blown off. She claimed, okay, so his wife, uh, when, uh, upon admitting him, claimed that he had attempted suicide three times just important to get that on the record. He had been attempting suicide three times already. So if he ever pulls it off, just know there's a precedent there. Uh, he claimed, he, yeah, he attempted suicide, was hearing voices, and believed that the FBI and Jewish mafia was out to get him. Literally everyone but the CIA. And uh, so his wife had him committed, in which he was treated with electroshock therapy. Oh. Years, a year after... Uh, spoiler alert, George DeMorne Schultz kills himself, or kills himself. A year after his death, though, his wife would go on to tell a journalist a very different story about what pre precipitated George's hospitalization. I'm reading Family of Secrets here. She claimed that a doctor had appeared in Dallas for a brief period and administered injections to him. Following those injections, she said, George suffered a nervous breakdown, at which point she decided to have him hospitalized. The doctor, she claimed, vanished into thin air. I'll also note here... Uh, Jeanne de Morinchel, George's wife, was also longtime friends with former CIA director Richard Helps. <laughs> so I just want to close it out here with just like a, just a little bit about the circumstances surrounding George de Morinchel's death. So in 1977, Bush leaves the CIA because you know people like he had a very very short tenure as CIA director. He begged because you know the Republicans lost the election. And he begged Carter to allow him to extend his tenure and really get done the reforms that he really was trying to implement. That didn't work. Carter canned him and, and uh, appointed this guy, Admiral Stansfield Turner, to reform the CIA. And he was a longtime Navy guy who actually did want to reform the CIA. And in Houston, we'll get into what happened in the, <laughs> to the Carter administration for going up against the Bushes. But, so, uh, remember, the, remember the Dutch uh, TV producer, TV reporter, uh, Willem Alt Altman? Um, so, he, uh, he returned to Dallas in 1977, and, and Mor like, Morinshall contacted him, and he began to hint that he was writing something and wanted to tell Altman something troubling. Um, when he first sees uh, Morinshall for the first time in years, he is shocked at, like, how fucking, how bad it's gotten. Like, this guy's, like, he looks like, he looks haggard, he's paranoid, he like, used to be a, a man of some, of some vigor, and it was an active tennis partner, and now he was a fucking complete wreck. And then he starts telling Altman all this shit about how he knew Jack Ruby, and was a very compartmentalized part of a plot of Texas oil men and intelligence operatives to kill John F. Kennedy in Dallas. He begs Altman to take him out of the country, and, uh, and then Altman takes him to his home in Amsterdam. He puts him up at his house and helps him edit the memoir he's working on called I Am a Patsy, I Am a Patsy, both in exclamation points. This goes oh, yeah, fine. What does that mean? <laughs> this goes fine for a couple of days until Altman, keep in mind himself also somewhat intelligence adjacent, says an old friend who is a Soviet diplomat will be joining them for lunch. The man arrives, and Morinshield said he'd like to take a brief walk, a brief constitutional before lunch. Who doesn't like to do that? So he leaves the house and never returns. He goes to Belgium and then gets a flight back to Florida. 
And, and one of the things that was found on him at the scene of his body, like with, on his body, was an affidavit that he had prepared accusing Altman of betraying him. And when you think about this in the context of like how George de Mornschild knew Lee Harvey Oswald and the role he played here in Dallas with Mr. Oswald, sort of shepherding him around ex-Russians, and then the whole thing of uh, uh, white Russians, but also the whole thing about Oswald being introduced to like arch-conservative anti-communist Russians after being an American who fucking... It's very weird. <laughs> went to the Soviet yeah, Union to renounce sense. his American citizenship and join a communist country. Yeah, and then marry the, the daughter of a KGB general, and then he comes home, and it's like, hey, here are like arch-reactionaries hanging out with them. And it was cool for some reason. But just like in the context of why he says like, so this, this Dutch TV guy is like, oh my, like he's losing his mind. He's starting to tell him all this shit about the Kennedy assassination. And then his friend says, oh, I have a friend of mine coming by. He's an ex-Soviet diplomat. You think in George Marshall's mind, he began to feel like Oswald in that like all of a sudden you're being placed around Soviet intelligence operatives. You're being placed around Soviets so that when you end up killing someone or kill yourself, you know, the, the narrative is pre credibly presented about your associations and contacts. So he returns to Florida, and the uh, House Select Committee on Assassination learns of this and sends one of their investigators to interview him. A man named, I, this is not made up, one of the coolest names ever, Gaten Fonzie. <laughs> Gaten Fonzie. He learns that Gaten Fonzie is on the way to interview him while he is being interviewed by Edward J. Epstein, no relation. <laughs> of Reader's Digest magazine. He kills himself later that afternoon. And then the one, he, he blows his head off with a shotgun, and then the other, the other part about that story I really love is that in Bill O'Reilly's book, Killing Kennedy, he invents a story about how when he was a TV producer here in Dallas, he found out that Morin Schultz had returned to the United States and found out, he claims he found that the house he was staying at, and he says that he was knocking on the door going, come out, pinhead! <laughs> as the guy put a shotgun in his mouth and blew his head off. I just think he killed himself because he didn't want to talk to Bill O'Reilly. Well, that, that's the funny thing. It's like, that's the story you're telling. It's like, yeah, this guy blew his head off instead of talk to me. <laughs> so just, and the, so sorry, there's just one last detail about the circumstances of his suicide. The shotgun that he used to kill himself was placed in the guest room that he was staying in by the proprietor of the house, a loaded shotgun was placed in his bedroom because she said she heard strange noises the other night. I mean, whatever, it's Texas, I buy it. <laughs> I, they, there's basically like, there's this whole constellation of people that the FBI investigated after the George de Morenschild suicide, including a guy named Jim Savage, who uh, was an executive at Transcontinental Drilling Company who knew both Poppy and George de Morenschild. Jim Savage was someone who uh, Morenschild gave his car to to drive from the airport back home. Uh, he'd worked with Demore and Schild, and he'd also been a friend and colleague. Uh, no, he worked for a company called Kerr McGee, which, who was uh, uh, for the Senator Robert Kerr, who was a colleague of Prescott Bush. In 1952, Savage uh, gave Poppy Bush a tour of Kerr McGee before he started Zapata Petroleum. And wouldn't you know it, the Kerr McGee oil company was very instrumental in setting up George Bush very nicely in the oil business. So Poppy leaves the CIA in 1977. Uh, after a very brief tenure, and of course he begged Jimmy Carter to let him stay on to you know, continue the important work he was doing. So he leaves government and goes back to the old family business, banking. But he does it here in Texas. He is hired as a special consultant to the first international bank shares of Dallas, which was at the time Texas's largest bank holding company. Under his reign, FIB acquired 50 banks and was only turned down by the Federal Reserve one time. Quick side note, <laughs> First International Bank Shares of Dallas is owned by close family friends of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. 14 months after being hired as a special consultant, FIB went bankrupt and was bailed out by the government for $3.5 billion. But let's talk about another Texas bank, Maine Bank of Houston. It's a small, charming community bank with only about 58 million in deposits, which was, between October 1978 and December 1979, buying $10.4 million a month in new $100 bills. Main Bank of Houston is notable here for two reasons. One, because the principal investors was a, the principal, one, of the, one of the principal investors was a Bush family crony by the name of Jim Bath. 
He was a guy who met and befriended George W. Bush during their service together in Vietnam in the Air National Guard. But two, and probably more importantly, it was the first time a joint Texan-Saudi banking partnership was done publicly. Just two months after Poppy became CIA director, Jim Bath started an aircraft brokerage firm. And he became acquainted with, because they wanted to buy planes from him, two scions of two very wealthy Saudi families, the Bin Mahfouzes and, of course, the Bin Ladens. <laughs> the principal investors in Main Bank of Houston were Jim Bath, Khalid Bin Mahfouz, another Saudi named Gaith Farron, and one more guy, former Texas Governor John Connolly. So I just like to think about this like, sorry about getting you shot, John, but here's a really sweet banking job I've got lined up for you after that magic bullet went through your wrist. Reading here from Family of Secrets, what most distinguished the tiny main bank was the highly unusual amount of cash the bank dispersed, more than $10 million a month in $100 bills. The authorities often consider such untraceable money flows to be signs of criminal activity, particularly money laundering often connected with drugs. Cash, however, is also the principal tool of covert operations. Uh, students of history will note that this bank is operating in the same time frame as Saudi intelligence is ramping up its Wahhabization policy of dumping maybe some of those fresh $100 bills in hotspots around the world where U.S. and Saudi enemies exist. Main Bank of Houston, however, was merely a minnow compared to the Leviathan known as the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, or the world's sleaziest bank. Khalid bin Mahfouz owned 20% of BCCI, and Gaith Farron, one of the principal investors in Main Bank of Houston, was understood to be their front man in the United States. BCCI was founded in the early 70s and shuttered in 1991, but forgotten now for a time was probably the big biggest financial fraud and criminal conspiracy in human history. Reading more from Russ Baker, he describes it as a vast entity connected to the Pakistani military regime and key Gulf states with banks and branches in 73 countries, including 50 developing ones. Although its founder, Aga Hassan Abedi, along with his top brass, emphasized their Muslim religiosity, the institution would apparently do anything for anyone willing to pay for their services needed to be kept quiet. These range from helping Pakistan obtain a nuclear bomb to financing secret arms deals on behalf of the West while simultaneously serving as a money distribution network for many terrorist organizations. Some of their most famous clients include Saddam Hussein, terrorist mastermind Abu Nadal, Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega, and the elusive heroin kingpin of Asia's <laughs> golden triangle, Kun Sa. Despite having, and this is how evil this bank truly is, despite having a fucking a murderer's row of star banking clients, um, which also included Mossad, the MI6, and CIA, most of the uh, like deposits, or like most of, the, most of the funding was actually from ordinary people in developing countries, particularly in the form of remissions from guest workers from the Philippines working in Gulf countries. And when BCCI collapsed, millions of their patrons, many of whom were guest workers, lost what little they had of their life savings. Now, by 1988, in the last year of Poppy's reign as vice president, the Manhattan DA Robert Morgenthal informed the city of London, where BCCI was chartered, that he was seeking to indict it as a Ponzi scheme. In order to avoid a run on the bank and MI6, <laughs> the Bank of England closed BCCI. Now, almost every attempt by multiple countries to unravel the extent of this criminal empire ran into a wall called national security. Investigating it would simply compromise the secrets of their clients, a.k.a. the Pakistani military, the Mossad, CIA, and MI6. The man in charge of investigating BCCI in America? That's right, Robert Mueller. <laughs> would it surprise you to learn that his investigation turned up no evidence of the U.S. government enabling this vast criminal conspiracy? If he had looked a little harder, though, he might have found records of meetings between the BCCI's founder, Abedi, and at the time, Reagan CIA director, William Casey. Journalists alleged dozens of meetings between the two and alleged that they struck a deal to make BCCI the major conduit for covert operations. It was the way to launder millions of dollars in funds that had not been authorized by Congress. Another way around the old church committee. And here's another little thing. 
the guy in charge of regulating BCCI, when it, people believed it was just a bank and not a criminal conspiracy, the assistant secretary for enforcement under the Reagan-Bush administration was a man named John Walker, Poppy's cousin, George H.W. Bush's cousin. So here's where it gets good. So we talked about like how he uh, had a hand in stitching up Kennedy and Nixon. But like, keep in mind, he was out of office at this point and was very sore at the fact that Jimmy Carter and the Democrats had taken the White House, which is always the real prize. Um, and not, not only that, uh, Jimmy Carter had appointed a guy named Stansfield Turner to be the director of the CIA, who genuinely was an outsider to the intelligence community. So here's, where, here's what he does. He basically ensnares, the, or it's like the people connected to him ensnare uh, the uh, director of Carter's Office of Budget, Management and Budget in a banking scandal, and they would use it in their effort to retake the White House in 1980. Uh, because of that scandal, uh, Bert Lance resigns in 1977, and that's where Poppy and his friends step in. Lance is out of work and broke as shit. So imagine his surprise when Aga Hassan of Betty and Gaith Ferron are interested in buying Lance's bank stock, which was okay because Lance had already been approved by American regulators. Lance, of course, enthusiastically agreed and essentially became the unwitting middleman for the introduction of the BCCI into the American banking system. So if anyone investigated this, Lance's name would be front and center and not far off from his friend and former business partner, Jimmy Carter. So you begin to see why Carter's attempts to open up the books on the CIA went absolutely nowhere. Also, little known fact, uh, Jimmy Carter's idiot brother was also involved in an arms deal <laughs> with Gaddafi and was given classified intelligence by Brzezinski, Mika's dad. It's a big new. So this is really what takes us from the end of Nixon to the beginning of the Reagan administration. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Poppy Part 3.